first of all, thank you all. This is a true honor and a privilege. And to be straight, let's be honest, four or five years ago, I probably wouldn't even be welcome in this space. And even now, I'm certainly an outsider. Um, not as much as maybe I would have been, and maybe you and I, um, you know, we've, I fit sort of like if we were to go to the hairdresser. That's kind of how I fit in this room, similar. Um, but over the last number of months, we've been enjoying a very thoughtful conversation as we try to pursue some common interest. And so you all know, conversation's already been brought up this morning um, about this whole concept of beef on dairy. Here's just the reality. To this point, most of the conversation is centered around shameless shilling, promotion, pom-pom waving, and the like. The reality is, let's just be blunt. You all need a profit center in your business, period. And so let's use some data. Let's use some facts and some science and take a breed agnostic look at which type of beef, beef cattle actually work to complement to add profit to the terminal side of your business. The place where you and I converge is we're all involved in the beef business. And so at that spot, let's see if we can use some data to help just a bit. And so first thing, we have a slide with a bunch of words. That's lovely, but I think really this is, this is the spot we, have, we find ourselves in. Surely to some extent in the beef business, certainly in your business at present, our backs are in a corner here just a little bit. And we can wax poetic about a whole bunch of different things, but the reality is with a little desire, you and I can find some little path where we can tiptoe out of that corner without getting paint all over us, okay? I think at this point, we'd even take a little paint on us if we had to, uh, to get out of that corner. And so that's what we're gonna talk about here for the next little bit. By the way, should you have a question or a comment Sometimes once somebody pulls my little chain on the back, I can roll for a while. So if you got a question and it's really pressing in the moment and the thing's on the screen, just scream at me. I'll just stop. Just yell chip or some sort of word that sounds similar as long as it's not too gruff at me, and we'll just stop right there, okay? And even if you're gruff, I've heard it all before. This has been our business. This is a pretty little picture of a, well, I guess a big old oxen. Um, some of you may have seen this. This calf actually resides in the second largest canyon in the United States, the Paladura Canyon in Amarillo, Texas, which, or south of Amarillo, Texas, which for most of my life was the center of the beef business. Not so much anymore that's moved a little farther north, but um, for a good portion of my life, Amarillo was the hub of deciding everything that went on the beef business. The problem is this calf actually speaks a little too much to what we actually think of when we talk about the beef business. And that is, eh, it'll work itself out. Well, we can see in certain cases when we allow things just to work themselves out, sometimes we get ourselves in a little bit of a conundrum. And chance has been way, way too prevalent, at least in my side of the business, and I guess to some extent relative to the beef side of yours has been the same. And so I'm going to talk about an approach, but first you need to kind of understand from whence the approach comes. IGS, International Genetic Solutions, what is it? Well, to be clear, it is a collaborative effort of a whole bunch of beef breed associations who essentially find themselves sick of the drama and just want the truth. And so there are 12 at present that have been longstanding members. Another three are already added. We're in the process of incorporating their data. And we have a list of breed associations who want in on our side of the business. We have nearly 20 million head in our database. That isn't as impressive when you compare that maybe to the dairy side of the business, but when you look at the beef side of the business, that makes it the largest beef genetic evaluation on the planet by almost twice. And you know the second one. And so that's important, but even more than the size of the effort, size would be limiting if it wasn't for this last piece. If we're gonna look at a breed agnostic approach, Typically, to be frank, we look at those breed agnostic tools relative to our commercial beef industry, our, the more traditional side of our business. But we can use some of those same things here. And so the beauty of IGS is it allows us to get EPDs, genetic tools, on a whole bunch of different breed types. They're directly comparable, and we can also compare composites or hybrids of those breed types. That's crucial to the conversation we're having here today because if that weren't the case, we'd be extraordinarily limited in our information. 
So, much like your business, your business is a tech company. That's what it is. Sometimes we don't like to think about that, um, myself included. I love the romance of our business. I love the, 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 the cultural aspects. I love the society that I work with. Those things feel a lot better when I'm making money. Those things don't do quite enough when I'm not. And so, in our business, we openly admit, we're a big data tech company. And so, our job is to empower series producers in this room or in others, just like you all do. Lots of data points. We can do any breed of cattle. Beef cattle, I wouldn't be so brazen to say we could do that on the dairy side. Um, we can also do those crossbred cattle, again, a crucial component, and we come up with novel, novel tools. And I just highlight one of them because we'll come back to this thing called the feeder profit calculator here in just a moment. That's going to be relevant and germane to our conversation. Um, we continue to see significant growth in what we're doing because on the beef side of the business, people are hungry for the truth. And so as a result, we are growing at a rapid clip, a rapid clip. Just in one particular option, actually our smallest option by a lot, where we have commercial folks, just to give you a sense of the growth, year-over-year -year growth in our commercial option, 132%. 100, yeah, 132%. That's a significant number. All those things mean little to you from a day-to-day -day standpoint, other than my hope is to plant that we have a little bit of cred in our space. Because if we're going to help you solve some of your conundrums or open other doors for you, you got to believe that we're legit. And so, again, I could stand up here and wave pom-poms and all that other nonsense. Just not going to do it. There's enough people in the beef business that will do that for you just fine. So, you all know better than most of the folks that I visit with on a regular basis about how driven we are from data. But you may be a little bit less tied into how data-driven we are on the beef side. Okay? That may not be something you've focused as much on. Maybe it is. And so, a couple things just come to mind, and I could have chosen a hundred different pieces. But I think this was important, and many of you are probably aware of this. This happened so many number of months ago now, what we're probably, I don't know, flirting in the six month range, Glenn, does that seem about right? Um, but this is important because we're a little bit immune to that last piece, or that, that piece up on the screen, or we sort of think we are. But when a firm the size of Walmart says they're gonna track every head of lettuce, every single head of lettuce all the way through their system through this whole blockchain approach and you all are probably pretty familiar with blockchain if not we can talk about that later that tells me ladies and gentlemen that they're going to track us at a really really high level and again that can make you shiver you can you can get flustered with it and all those kind of things those things simply don't matter the reality is what the reality is and so we have to play in the water that we're that we're in and the re and the reality is not only do folks want traceability components, right? But they want facts that they can use to make decisions in their business, to share with their consumers, so on and so forth. Um, again, I knew Glenn was gonna be here, so, you know, um, I at least had to show, I could have shown one or two other deals, but this is just an example of serious traceability efforts that are taking place on the beef side of the business. That is not really the point of my discussion other than it is clearly a data, uh, serious data capture, but probably more important for you all is this particular genre actually is a tremendous opportunity for the dairy side of the beef business. We'll maybe talk about that. That's just shameless shilling. I had to do one thing. We work with IMI Global. Many of you are familiar with IMI Global. Uh, they're a partner with us on this feeder profit calculator tool. Again, just trying to establish a little bit of legitimacy and cred with you. Um, IMI does a tremendous amount in your space as well. And then again, things like Tyson recently partnering up with a firm called Progressive and the like. Data drives the beef business. Now, to be clear, it doesn't drive the beef business near as much as data has driven your business. You all in animal agriculture are a model that many of us can't follow, okay? To be honest, you're out in front of us a little bit on certain things. We concede that point and we tip our hats to you. So I do not want to be dismissive. And most of you in this room have far more experience in seasoning than I do. And so you, even though you're a professional today, today on the dairy side, you've been 
fairly vested at one point or another probably in your life in terms of awareness of the beef business. But just in case you haven't needed that or it's been a while, I want to remind us of a couple things because the language is going to be important if we're going to try to establish which bulls are relevant. So just a real quick beef 101, but from the terminal side of the business, okay? We're not going to talk about cows and the maternal component. This is purely the terminal side of the beef business. So remind ourselves some feedlot basics. There's a lot of words up there. If you can't read them all, that's just fine because I can still read a little bit. And from that distance, I can read a lot better than if it was right here. I'd have to put my glasses on if it was right here. To be clear, if you're in the feedlot sector, health is objective number one. Maybe even more today than ever. If you're not familiar, and probably most of you wouldn't have a reason to be too dialed in on this sector, feedlots at present are having some pretty serious health concerns. Um, especially on some straight bred breed types, they're really having some significant health concerns. Um, and these are not at any level minor. And so one of the things we do know is that crossbreds from a terminal standpoint are gonna be more successful in a feed yard setting. That actually is a benefit to you all. It's a great deal of benefit actually, okay? And so crossbred cattle are gonna give us some opportunities and that's germane to this discussion. A lot of words gives you something to read while I ramble just a little bit. But we want to remind ourselves what the core ingredient, what the core purpose is of a feedlot. Their job is to put on cheap gain. That's it. Simple as that. We can, we can confuse it with a whole bunch of other metrics. Their job is to make cattle grow bigger at a cost-effective uh, standpoint. Now, we can sometimes get confused on uh, various gain and efficiency, met efficiency metrics in the beef business, and we get confusing. But the reality is we think like a banker. How much does it cost to make an animal gain X? period. That's the way it works, okay? And so we need to think about that. And again, we want to recognize some of the things. We just have to recognize what's in front of us. In the feedlot sector, straight dairy cattle tend to be less efficient. As a result, they gain slower. They're in the feed yard longer. That adds up cost, risk in terms of financing cost, yardage. It becomes a detriment, is what it is. And then in a feed yard setting, in today's world, Again, if you haven't sold fat cattle in a long time or kept up with that space, it might stun you. We sell more 1,600-pound cattle today than we sell 1,200-pound cattle, which, again, can be a bit, of it, a bit of an opportunity for this particular audience. It also means we got to really ride the razor's edge just a little bit because the industry is trying to raise these heavier cattle. Um, there's a variety of dynamics, and we can go into those later if somebody would like to. So... The, the frame, the scale of a Holstein poses some opportunity. However, that opportunity is a little bit mitigated because as beef genetics have been pushed to where some of them have the capacity to get to those heavier weights, now when we get those big weights from both sides of the equation, we can put ourselves in a conundrum where we're making carcasses that are too big. And those carcasses that are too big, if you, and I know that you all know, a packer will, uh, again, John mentioned I work for IBP. If you don't remember that name, that would be Tyson in today's world. And at one point in time, I spent two years of my life in the largest beef packing plant on the planet. Um, learned a great deal there. It was a tremendous experience for me. I saw more straight Holstein carcasses get split in half and have to get hung up again than I can even begin to tell you. And that was a long time ago. And that's only been exacerbated. So we have to be sensitive to the size issue just a little bit. Carcass basics. Again, we're not, like I said, we're not going to belabor these things. If you're in a packing plant, one of the key ingredients to you to make money is dressing percent, meaning what percentage of the carcass gets hung up versus what goes into the offal, the hides, and the like. And there's just a difference, and we know these things. Again, I'm just reminding you of certain things so we can lay the groundwork. Um, beef cattle tend to dress somewhere in the mid-60s. Dairy cattle somewhat shy of that. Again, just reiterate this size issue. Carcass length, to be honest, typically in the beef business is not talked about. It's not something, it's, it's not an issue. We don't have to talk about it. But we've got to think about this manufacturing facility. This packing plant is essentially a manufacturing facility that is set up in a certain way. Rails are this high, equipment's a certain height, uh, the, the scaffolding and areas where employees' stands are at certain, they're at certain heights. And if animals start to fall way out of those ranges, that becomes a problem. And so beef cattle typically don't get outside of those ranges short of us working in a cow plant or more uh, getting an occasional few bulls. But with this particular group, we have to be sensitive to that carcass length. That adds labor cost if we're not careful. 
And then one other thing from a carcass, well, there'll be more. From a carcass basis, we have to ponder is muscle conformation. And again, this is a, an interesting piece for us. And again, in your business, is not something you've had to worry about, of course. Um, that's the beef side's challenge. But we do need to remember that um, muscle conformation, that dairy type, again, becomes a pretty significant discount. A couple other quick things on carcass, and then we'll move on from our beef 101. Quality grade. You all know quality grade. You've all seen it, heard it, talked about it. When you go to a steakhouse, you go to the grocer. Quality grade is essential, essentially palatability. Or the real reason quality grade matters is if you're a chef at a restaurant, you have a lower percentile of turning, returning a steak because you don't like it, the more, the more intramuscular muscular fat there is. The more marbling, the less likely you're going to be unhappy, and the less likely you're going to turn it back. So we talk about eating quality and all these things, and it's true. But let's just cut really through it all. Marbling is pushed so hard because it returns fewer steaks at high-end steakhouses. That keeps people happy, especially people who run the restaurant. Historical artifact. When I was first starting out in my career, which again, had 20-ish years ago kind of thing, um, it wasn't that long ago when Holsteins in particular were known to outgrade the beef marketplace. When I worked for IBP Incorporated in the late 90s in Amarillo, Texas, that plant, if we could average 60% choice on a given day, we were tickled to death. You do that today in the beef business, you'll be fired tomorrow. It's that fast. But at that same time, when we were averaging 55 to 60%, the Holsteins we would harvest in that plant would average 70. Yeah, pretty awesome. Now today, if I go to a plant, let's say I go to a plant in Lexington, Nebraska, they'll probably average percent choice somewhere around 84%. And if they were to kill some Holsteins, you know what they would average? About 70. You all haven't had a reason to select for such a thing. It's not been your job, your purpose. And so as the beef industries changed, you all went from being the leaders in marbling or one of them to being behind the curve a little bit. So we have to be able to address that. Um, Again, some of you probably saw this back in an FFA class or at some point. Uh, this is our, our beef quality grading grid. The long and the short of it is we're looking at this stuff here uh, closest to me. The quality grades of prime choice select are really what matters to us today in the beef business. Stuff on the other side, we're probably not making a lot of money. So again, just to remind you what those look like, and you all know there's a number of certified programs that fit those, and so we can talk about those if you like. This is that positive eating experience. This is the reason we push quality grade in the beef business. Simple as this. The higher you get, the less likely somebody's returning that, so I got to make two steaks instead of one. Pretty simple. Or, or maybe as for us guys in the room who were, we rationalized it because our wives were busy, but instead of taking them out to eat the other night, we cooked steaks at home for them. Remember that? Yeah, some of us did. My bride's very patient with me. Um, but in that case, we, we don't get to impress them very often, so we have to try when we can. So a quality eating experience is good there. All right. And then the other side of the quality yield grade equation um, is cutability or the actual yield grade component. And there's another area we have to be sensitive to. I know these, this color on the slide next to me is a little bit, maybe a little awkward, actually. It's because it's covered, and you can't probably tell that. But we have a dairy type on this side and a beef type on that side. Just to remind ourselves, in a packing plant, and this would actually be a pretty large beef or dairy ribeye here on my side. This would be an impressive dairy ribeye. When that goes across the grade chain, they can identify it that fast. They don't escape. They're nailed every single time because a packing plant knows they can. They can discount them for dairy type. So again, the things that are a conundrum for us, specifically to us, meaning the folks in this room, carcass length, quality grade, and muscle conformation are infinitely well identified at a pack and plant. You don't get to sneak them through. You get exposed. So we have to realize these things so that we can move forward. A number of weeks ago, I was driving to one of these sort of events for people on my side of the equation. I was listening to a fellow on the radio. Um, I'm pretty terrible. I can't listen to music. It really bores the crap out of me. Plus, to be really honest, for the young, few young folks that happen to be in the room, 
most of it offends the hell out of me. So um, I try not to listen to that much of it. I feel like I've become a less moral human being than I was before I turned the radio on. So I listen to people who talk at me a lot. And I was listening to a fellow the other day, and I thought he really boiled this down really good. His definition of the concept of frustration, he made it simple for this hillbilly to understand. He said, it's really no more complicated than this. It's the stress and the anxiety associated with the difference between the way you want things to be and the way things really are. I get that. That's frustration. And right now, specifically to this particular group, we have a point of frustration. We have an animal that, to a large extent, is a byproduct in your business that has value. How do we identify how to make that value predictable so that the person who's buying those can no longer continue to hold you over the table and take advantage of the situation? So let's get past that frustration and see if we can do something. And so we're going to try, as you all have been trying for a long time, to really address this whole calf, this beef on dairy calf as a profit center for your particular business. Again, you all know this has become commonplace. Jason was talking about a little bit ago, okay? This is not unusual. That's not the concern. I know it's not unusual. Here's the problem, and if you can't read this from where you're at, the beef sire of choice in these equations is rarely the one that makes the most sense. You know who the bull that's used most frequently? The one they have a lot of semen on. Period. That's it. So again, what you're getting is a bull who might have been very popular and they just overcollected him. Or you might be getting a bull they got a lot of semen on and even the beef people didn't want him. And so they go, hey, so what do they all do? They pull up, they got their sleeve on, they're ready to go, oh, I got you covered. I, I got this. I can make this cheap. Yeah, it's cheap because nobody wants it. We need to empower you all to go a different direction than that. Your business is worth more than that. So here's what happens. If we think about this from a buyer's perspective, because way too often we think about it from a supplier's perspective. I'm producing th something, you should want it. Well, what you're producing is something they know too. Way too frequently you're getting the offline beef sire, of, regardless of the breed type, and you're making calves that are, meh, they're okay. They're a better terminal beast than they were before, but they're just okay. And they're highly variable. You're wanting folks to bet on you, yet we're just adding another level of risk to their business, the variability. At least with the straight Holstein, they do what they got every time. So buyers are skeptical, and as a result, it limits the dollars they're going to drop. And so here's the truth. We need data. That's how I think, again, that's what I saw in the first couple things here this morning is loads and loaded, loads of data and numbers. You all know how to function with that. So, I'll quit running my mouth and we'll get busy. Let's see if we can actually address this problem, again, from a data-driven, breed agnostic approach. Step one. So about a year ago, I was approached by a consortium of interested parties who uh, were trying to solve a dilemma. Actually, it was a, a fairly strong, prominent regional dilemma where a packer that no longer harvests Holsteins, so we might know who that is, a major packer was having some regional concerns about keeping chains full in a particular region that no longer harvests Holstein cattle. And so it became a bit more of a large-scale economic development effort where you actually had a packer trying to identify what was the right beef types to suggest to the folks who were supplying them cattle so that they could maintain the economic prowess of a particular region in the country. That's cooperation at a level we don't see in this business very often. That's really what drug us into this thing a little bit over a year ago. And so in that process, again, we had a major packer, a number of cattle feeders who feed a lot of Holstein and Holstein-influenced cattle, dairy operators like yourself, some seed stock folks both from the dairy side and the beef side, and some association type people involved as well. 
And the long and the short of it is we shared a lot of data back and forth. We spent months conversing about something that would work for their platform, for their folks. And what we really came down to, and I know you might not be able to see these things if, if you're way in the back, but what we came down to is there are four particular phenotypes that are really crucial to this particular conversation. Marbling, ribeye area, size, however you want to define that, and cavities. Cavities we won't talk near as much about, but let's be clear, cavities is a big deal because your females, while your cows have the latitude to have a pretty big cat. The reality is, you're, as we clearly saw, you're breeding beef bulls to more and more different females, considering more and more different age females to be bred to beef cattle. Plus, we realize there's going to be some heterotic effect relative to birth weight. We need to be on the front side of that, not on the back side. So, we need to address marbling, ribeye size, body size and calving ease. We also queried the second largest breed genetic evaluation in this country for the same basic thresholds. The answer was overwhelmingly clear. Overwhelming. Kind of surprised me to be frank. Before we get to that answer, step two. In May of 2018, so some number of months later, we came out with something that was a massive shift in the beef industry, something that you all probably don't have to worry about, but it was the introduction of our new software approach to genetic evaluation. It's a single step approach that is the only mega database on the planet that is multi-breed, that single implements genomics. It was pretty groundbreaking and took us a number of years to put together. This was not an easy lift. It took a science team a lot of years to build this. It changed a lot of things about our business really, really quick. After that, we revisited this beef on dairy question using some of the same basic approach that we used early in the year, and it gave us the exact same answer. The answer was this. When we searched our database, and again, the second largest one, and those who encompass almost all of the beef cattle in the United States, and actually ours encompass most of Canada and a good portion of Australia, for whatever that matters. When we sorted them by those things I just talked about, top 25% for ribeye area, top 25% for marbling, and a mid-level threshold for those size proxies, yearly weight and carcass weight, the results were a little over 3% of the cattle that worked in that situation were Angus bulls. A little over six were straight continental bulls. Again, for those of you who don't play in the beef industry anymore, it's been a while since FFA. You remember the straight continentals are the ones who came from Europe. The British are the ones who came from England, if you recall. 90% um, were composite bulls. And it makes perfect sense. Because what are we asking to do? We're asking to do things for the Holstein female that no single breed has really ever been selected for in and of itself. No breed historically has been selected to moderate mature size, to add ribeye, to add marbling, and to add cavities. There are a lot of folks who tell you they can do all those things. Let me tell you, biologically, that's damn difficult. And so, it makes sense. And in the beef business, using composite bulls is becoming a very frequent deal, so it was easy to source. 90% were composite bulls. And of those 90%, 90% of those were semangus. That was the answer. We consistently saw the same answer over and over, that the complements of Simmental cattle and Angus cattle, which are probably the hottest cross in the beef business, it wouldn't shock you then when you come over here, it makes sense on a Holstein. But that's what the data said, not Chip or John or somebody else. That's what the data says. This is USDA data. Our data would look similar, but we'll just use USDA because they're not affiliated with us. This is Meat Animal Research Center data. And if you look, it will tell you what I just said in a lot less rambling and quick fashion. These two breeds on the beef side just balance themselves. They work together. Some of you probably haven't seen what you would call a Simmental or a Simangus animal in a long time. And you probably think a Simmental or a Simangus animal looks like something that you were taught in the late 80s or the early 90s. 
not so much. Um, we can go through the history of why they are different creatures than they once were, um, but many of you think of a simmental as a yellow and white spotted animal that was that tall. Those make up about 1.8% of our population. Okay, this is the more Americanized version. I just picked one picture. That's the most prevalent bull in our in our business over the last five or six years. So it gives you a sample of what a simmental Angus influenced animal would look like. In case you haven't seen one in a long time. So what we did there in those initial looks were a threshold approach. And a threshold approach is a nice little quick glance, okay? But it's not terribly sophisticated. And as we heard talking about earlier, indexing makes a lot more sense. So we needed a different approach. The thresholds were a nice way to come out of the gate, but we needed something more. So revisit this thing we call the feeder profit calculator. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this because I can ramble a long time on it, but I will be really quick. More or less, we built this tool about a year and a half ago to allow folks in our side of the business to have kind of a common language with which to speak. If you're selling calves, you're buying calves, you actually put a profit prediction in dollars and cents on a set of calves, okay? And so there's a whole bunch of stuff about it. You can talk about it, but that's not really the base of this other than to tell you this is where this conversation starts. And here's about as far as we'll go on the details of the feeder profit calculator. More or less, we know in our side of the business, the Angus bull is by some margin the most heavily used creature. He just is. And so, we take these basic assumptions, we run a producer set of feeder calves against those assumptions. It gives us essentially a differential and break even. Talks to us in terms of added value of the calf. Or we don't play with the, the, the baseline. The, there is no adjustment to the base, so zero is the base. And so sometimes it's not added value, sometimes it's actually a, a decrease in value. But that's where this conversation starts because what we're talking about here are totally terminal calves. So we thought, well, a totally terminal tool makes a perfect place to start. So what we did is we went and looked at all of the homozygous black and homozygous pole, half blood or three five eighths semangus bulls in our population. It's quite a few, it's all, many, many thousands. And we took all of those bulls and we ran up against what we know about the Holstein cow type from a terminal metric standpoint terms of the basic parameters for gain, carcass metrics, and those kind of things. Assumed the calves were high health and highly managed, and that gave us back a set of results on every bull in the deal. Then we adjusted those results for these three things. This is where we kind of get into a bit more of an indexing approach. Without getting into the math, we applied a curvilinear approach to that feeder profit calculator to whereby we punished bulls that put us at risk for ribeye area, meaning if you didn't have a lot of ribeye area to help offset the lack of ribeye area in a Holstein, you're gonna get punished. Same deal for calving ease. And for body length, we were able to, this was a little bit of fun for us because this is not something we typically would do in the beef business, but we were fortunate. The science team was able to dig through and find some really strong correlations in the literature about comparing what we think of as traditional growth metrics to body length. And so we actually found very, very strong uh, correlations and so we built a little bit of a novel tool to estimate body length. We put all those things into two different curvilinear approaches because we want to be straight with you. We think we've done about as good as any human could do at this point in time in the state of our two business models of finding these answers. But we also can see nobody's tried to dabble in this space to this level before. And so we don't want to blow smoke. We developed an approach we think is really solid, but then we had the team also take a secondary look and say, if we were going to go a different way, what's another approach we might try? So we developed two different curvilinear models, and we used both of them. And so we forced that the bulls that made it into this conversation had to make it into the top 500 in both of those approaches. Clearly, there's a lot of overlap, but that limited us back down to a little over 300 some odd bulls, okay? So that showed the two approaches showed a lot of uniformity, but there certainly were some differences. So we took that subset of Simangus bulls, and then we whittled them down based on accuracies. In beef parlance, we used a BIF accuracy of 0.4. You all would think of that in your platform on your scale, that'd be a, a, an accuracy of 0.8, okay? Beef industry and dairy industry talk different terminologies on that. 
We were blessed. There were a lot of different producers involved in producing those bulls. It gave us bulls that ranged from the age of from models from 2014 to 2018, but we recognized that to get practical, we probably need younger bulls to be able to be sourced. There may be a few older bulls out there that you could get your hands on, but again, this is some of these bulls are frankly out running in the trees in southern Missouri chasing cows, maybe. Okay, so that doesn't mean you're going to be able to get your hands on all of them. We have to be practical. When we looked at those bulls, these are the average genetic predictions, at least that are relevant to this audience. We took out all the maternal issues that, and longevity issues that really don't apply to this particular conversation. These are the average EPDs and indexes of these bulls. Some of you, probably most of you know these acronyms, but if you don't, real quick, calving ease, birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, carcass weight, yield grade, marbling, 12th rib back fat, 12th rib ribeye area, API, which is our all-purpose index, which is a whole life cycle index of profitability, and terminal index. And what you can see is this approach kind of compiled this set of metrics. We've compiled more files than I can possibly think of with different combinations of a whole bunch of different things. What you see on here is the breed makeup of this particular set of bulls. You can see they're all either half-bloods or three-eighths, five-eighths bulls. That were, those were the parameters we limited it to. And you can see these various columns. Again, they just represent the EPDs and indexes I just mentioned a moment ago. Now, when we start to whittle this thing down to 2017, 2018-year-old bulls or model bulls, we start to get this thing down to a pretty manageable number to start to identify some things. I, we're sitting somewhere in the 70s now, I think, for a, a couple reasons. That probably will expand to the better part of 100. But we're probably looking at roughly 100 bulls out of a database of nearly 20 million that we've whittled down to say, with the knowledge we have at present, these are the bulls that make the most sense to make Holstein cows to make the Holstein cows, they're going to make you more money. So we can make this all amorphous all we want, but at the end of the day, the question is, does it put more money in your pocket so five years from now you're in a better spot than you are now? Or more importantly, for some of us in the room, in five years from now, can your kid or your grandkid see this as an opportunity where they can stay in this business? Sometimes we get it too far from reality. That's the reality. I want my kids to want to be in my business if they have a passion to. This, we think, gives you some opportunities. To make it a little more real, or would you? So, even within this group of 100-ish, you can really start to get fairly serious. Because what do we have to be realistic about? First of all, these bulls have to still be available. And this, to be clear, this list was compiled in very recent days. We're using the absolute latest knowledge we have. Recognizing many of these bulls are available, some probably aren't. But even within this list of 100, we have to then get them into channels where folks want and can use them. That means to a large extent, we need your Siemens company partners to want to get in and want to get in now. And they're going to select a little more intensely. And so I wanted to show you, even within that group, the little red, the boxes that are red, those are areas where that particular animal for a particular trait fell quite a little bit shorter than the rest of the cattle in this list. But because it's an index, that can happen sometimes, right? They can be really good in some other category, and that can get them in there. And that's what happened. Those that are in kind of the tan or orangish looking boxes, those are animals that excel quite a little bit for a given trait. For example, in this column, in this column here, this would be marbling, okay? If you get over one in marbling, that's an impressive spot to be in. That's an impressive spot to be in. Don't remind you. That's ribeye area. This is marble. Sorry. Same, same actual thing. If you get over one here, it's quite impressive. Same deal over here in ribeye. And so these two traits are quite important to us in this particular conversation. This is calving ease on this particular side. So, Lori, would you scroll down a little bit? And on the very right hand side, you see some of these that highlight in blue. Keep going a little bit farther. Right there, it's good. Um, and so you can see those in blue. Those are those who hit the absolute upper thresholds in our terminal index. So their bulls actually on the beef side of our business would be extraordinarily desirable. But it just so happens they also have a mesh of traits that work really good on your population. And these are the sort of, again, you can see a couple, well, for example, this particular bull right here. 
We have very few bulls in our business. He hit 100 on the terminal index. This guy does it. Got plenty of growth. Plenty of growth. Not crazy level growth. This 114 is yearling weight. There's a lot of bulls in our business who have more than that. But the problem is, you know what happens if we start to get a lot of them who get extreme more than that? They're going to get too big and drag it to the ground, right? That doesn't work in this business model. But we have a bull who still has plenty of yearling growth for a beef bull and who's in an elite level for marbling and ribeye. And as a result, he has a, a terminal index that really pushes the charts just a little bit. So we'll regret really putting it back to the power. So I wanted to show you, this is, there are reams and reams of that data. This is just a little view that gives you something to look at. Um, with that said, so what's the goal? The goal is to make this real. We can sit here and have academic discussions from now until forever. My folks in my business will suffer. Folks in your business will suffer. Or we can try to get busy solving this somehow. And so we went to a lot of effort. We, meaning the folks on the IGS, AESA side, and the folks um, at the Holstein Association, to really go back and forth and work through some of these <coughs> numbers. And we think there's some there there. Here's how much there there I think there is. In a recent conversation with a major cattle feeder, he and I were just talking, and I was talking in very cryptic ways about uh, feeding uh, partial Holstein cattle and things like that. This guy offered, without me ever going to this point because I wasn't in a position to even have this conversation then, he straight up told me, he said, if I could have my druthers on which cattle type I would feed, I was stunned when he told me this. I love them. He said, I feed them all the time and I can't get enough of them. I want a Sim Angus bull and some Holstein cows. He said, they will be consistent. They will grow good enough. They will cut good enough. They will be healthy because they have three breed cross on top of them. He said, this is a no-brainer. He said, you know an added bonus? He said, most of them come out of places where there's a high degree of traceability and knowledge, so I'm, prepper, I'm buffering myself going forward. That worked for us. And so your association and mine has been working together on an effort that's in its infant stages. There's, there are a lot of future things to talk about. Um, and I'll let John go in, or Darren, or whomever, go into more detail on this. But we wanted to announce the fact that we're going to be spending some time working together in, in a bit more of a collaborative effort to highlight which beef bulls really work in your business model. And we're going to work our level best to get those bulls out in the marketplace where you can take benefit of those. There will probably be some uh, longer term, bigger picture implications of this program, but those conversations are for another day. The biggest issue right now is we have to get things going. Uh, given the uh, biological uh, speed with which our, in, our in, animals work, we don't have a lot of downtime in this business. So we wanted to bring this to your awareness now. Um, here later today, actually, I'll be spending a little time with some of the association staff. We'll start looking specifically at some of the bulls. You know, actually, this whole sub list of bulls. They'll start dissecting things and making decisions as how they want to move forward and the like on your behalf. So this wholesome effort is something that we're very, very excited about. We think has a tremendous amount of legs going forward to make folks in your business more money. With that said, I would be remiss if I didn't point out the following. Are there challenges with your business model and business? Yeah, clearly. We, that's, I've talked about that over and over. But we don't want to forget there's a load of opportunity. A load of opportunity. Beef coming out of the dairy model? Consistent. Goes to what this feeder told me. Consistent. Your production costs, I guarantee you, you know your production costs more effectively than we know our cow costs on the beef side. Guaranteed. I mean, there's almost no debate in that. And anybody wants to debate that, they won't want to debate it very long. Doesn't mean yours are better or worse, just means you know them. There's another component. We're in California. Let me give you a little bit of good news or bad news. It depends on what side of the equation you are. If I go to the north end of this state, there's an amazing number of beef producers who are leaving northern California and just doing a cost-benefit analysis on land in the country to raise beef cows. I'm blessed because I live in central Missouri, and when they do that cost-benefit analysis, amazing number of those folks end up in south Missouri and northern Arkansas because there's cheap ground, lots of grass, reasonable labor. They're close enough to places to, to get cattle delivered to. 
I ain't seen what land cost does to the beef business. And unfortunately, what it's doing to portions of your state. That's a different conversation. We have that for another day. But you all are not immune to that, but more immune than maybe our friends on the beef side. Again, something I've already mentioned, there are tracking methodologies that you all have a bigger appetite for. And this is a big one. The conversation between you and I has absolutely zero to do with your maternal genetics. Don't know, not my space, that's yours. And so we can consider selection pressures that we wouldn't normally consider. So I just say thank you. Um, I, I tip my hat for the courage of some of the folks that have been involved in these conversations to, to even consider this. Um, for one, I'm, I'm humbled as just a, a simple hillbilly cowboy that to be able to be involved in these conversations, it's been a lot of fun. Your staff has been extraordinarily professional and on top of things in having these conversations. And I would say it was a bit of a serendipitous moment when we started working together. Um, things aren't accidents. I don't really believe in accidents and I don't really believe in luck all that much either. Um, and I think things happened the way they happened for, for grander reasons than that.